We're going to talk a little bit about uh, some uh, discussion board posts that you all have been uh, giving us in litigation. And I've actually enlisted uh, one of my colleagues, which is Ron Henderson, who is the smart one in the group. Uh, I just do it with mirrors. He's the one that's a brainiac, okay? But uh, what I'm really interested in is this whole thing about uh, personal service, the little, you know, argument that you're having about personal service uh, versus, you know, other kinds of service, uh, including my favorite, which is copy service, okay? And so I'm going to kind of start out and kind of lay the groundwork, and then I'm going to ask Ron to kind of chime in with his experiences too. But, um, you know, I, I've, I've seen you say, and I remember this in law school, I had this exact same view when I was in law school, that you should have personal service every time. And I remember that I had an old judge for my civil procedure teacher back in those days, and he says, uh, do you realize how absurd that is? I said, it just doesn't work like that. It just would never work like that. So there's some practical considerations and getting personal service. The one thing is, you know, that these people that serve these papers, they're humans, you know, they're not like Superman that, you know, have this x-ray vision. Oh, there he is, fly in, here's your paper, sir. It just doesn't work like that. Uh, you actually have to put the papers in their hand. So when are you gonna do that? Well, let's say the guy's at their 10, 10 in the morning, he doesn't know where the guy works. And uh, so the guy's off and gone to work, or maybe he's just out drinking, which is usually what they're doing. And, uh, and so he goes to the house uh, and uh, nobody's home. Or I've seen this 10 times when I've tried to serve papers myself. I walk up to a house and the drapes start fluttering. You know, like there's somebody in that house. There's a car parked in the driveway, but they won't come to the door. Now, do you think that the deputy can just walk in that house and serve that guy with those papers? No, why not? Because you have a right to your privacy in your home. And you know, if that's granny in the house and the guy's not in the house, you've invaded granny's privacy for no real good reason. I mean, just to serve some papers on a guy, okay? So, Ron, what do you think about that? Well, absolutely. Right now in today's society, we're so mobile. Technology advancements have made us, um, you know, so accessible in so many other ways. Personal service, a requirement of absolute personal service, it is absurd. And it's, it's terribly impractical. Yeah. Uh, there's so many ways to do it um, otherwise. And, like you said, um, you know, if you require it, we're probably going to backload uh, and, and backlog all of our court systems. It, it would be a horrible situation. Like yeah, you'd have a bunch of cases that were dying on the vine because you couldn't get person. service on the guy. Absolutely. Uh, now, let's talk about the unethical side of it. I'm sure you've seen it too. Uh, in my experience, I actually had a guy, and he thought this was funny, you know, but, but he... Uh, told me one time that he was doing a lot of landlord work and so he had just had him give him an address for an empty house. And he would show service on that empty house? Yeah, he would have him serve the papers on this empty house. People had never lived there and he knew it. Right. That's unethical as can be. Right. But the guy was actually getting copy service on a house where the people never lived. So the flip side of the argument is you're right. There are times when people abuse it. I've learned that. I did not ever even, you know, I'm too dumb to think of stuff like that. Sure. These really smart guys, they get themselves in trouble sometimes because they outsmart themselves even, you know. But that guy, uh, he actually admitted to me that they were actually serving the papers on an empty house that was really on the verge of being condemned and torn down. Right. Uh, but they're just... He would go by, actually, and pick the papers up himself just because the mailbox was filling up with these papers, you know. So, and it was all different people, you know. So, it was really unfortunate, you know, that that kind of stuff can happen. So, I can see your point, those of you that are in favor of personal service. You know, there are abuses in the system, but I would say that's pretty rare. Of all the times, you know, in 30 years, I heard of that once, 
you know. So, you know, I don't know that it's really worth that, but I understand your thinking on why you would want that. You know, uh, you're raised in the USA and you think that's the way it ought to be. Uh, and so it's understandable, but it's the problem that you get into is when your, your Bill of Rights bumps into these other practical considerations of, you know, well, how are we going to find this guy to get serve those papers in his hand? You know, let me ask you, uh, Ron, any experience with process servers? No, in fact, they're, they're very rarely used in mid-size, uh, you know, jurisdictions and, and cities like I've practiced in. Yeah, so which is basically Muncie. I was in Marion. I practiced in a few other places. I had a little bit of experience with it when I was in some bigger cities, as far as. Um, I, I had some truck drivers and stuff that were involved in litigation in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and even down in Oklahoma. So I had a few cases where I was actually traveling pretty far uh, on a contingency uh, and had to use a process server. Uh, which is, you know, the cost on that is all on the plaintiff. You got to front load those costs, pay them up uh, to get the guy to go out there. When you get in a bigger city like Indianapolis, very common. You know, Fort Wayne even sometimes uses process servers. And what those guys are a lot of times, uh, they can be police wannabes or they can actually be retired police, which is more favorable than a situation where you're getting somebody that you just don't know. They can be kind of shaky. And still the process is subject to abuse yeah. and, and dishonesty because you rely on an affidavit or the testimony of the person, the process server saying, yes, I did get actual personal service. Yeah. And so their credibility comes in, into play. I've got two really good favorite stories on that. I had a case where this guy was like 20,000 behind in a, in a child support. And I just had a, you know, a bone to pick with this guy. I knew the guy. Uh, dealt with him quite a bit and he just refused to pay child support. He had a great job and the money was coming right out of his check. It was $80 for two girls. It's not a huge amount of money, I mean, when you think about it. And he up and quit that job because he didn't want to pay child support. So the thing about the guy, the guy moves to Elkhart, Indiana to work in this factory uh, and uh, I kept trying to serve him by going to the Elkhart County Sheriff and uh, they kept going over there, but he was never home. Uh, well, come to find out, this guy, whenever the word got out that there was papers for him, he would just shoot across the border into Michigan and hide out at his mother's in some little town up there, I think it's called Corinth or something like that. But anyway, um, I hired, cost me $900. That just shows you. I mean, and I, it was a stupid move on my part because it was just a get even thing and, you know, but uh, I hired a state policeman, retired, who was a uh, private investigator out of Indianapolis to find the guy and serve him with the papers. And actually in that case, a little more complicated because I had a body attachment for him. So not only did he have to get him served, but the sheriff had to come and arrest him. So basically what he did, uh, he went and investigated up in Elkhart and got the poop on the guy, found out he went in this certain bar every day when he got off work, and uh, he just went in there and befriended the guy and talked to him, and then he throws him under citizen's arrest, and uh, the sheriff comes and grabs him, and they haul him down to the Grant County Jail where he sat for the next year, you know. And so I felt like I got value for my 900 bucks, you know. But the guy comes out, stops by, demands to see his kids, and then drives off into the horizon, never pays a penny of child support. Never did pay. So the next time I see the guy, he's 30000 behind in support. So it really do, it was just a battle of wills. So I call that um, same state trooper again. I'm like, look, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. He says, oh yeah, he says, I'm not gonna charge you for the second time, because it was so easy the first time. I said, well, would you go get him again? Because we got another body attachment out on him, now for 30,000. He says, get me the papers, I'll go up there. So I got it to him. He didn't charge me any more money. 
So I, you know, I got two for the price of one. Goes back to Elkhart, same bar. bar. Uh, the guy goes in the bathroom. He actually kind of stays uh, in the dark where the guy can't see him because the guy knows him now because of the first time he just walked up to him. So he gets him alone in the bathroom and handcuffs him in the bathroom and calls the deputy and takes him back for guess what? Another year in jail, you know. So basically, uh, that's my experience with a process server. So that's all I really know about it. Uh, you know, just like Ron said, it's very rare that I uh, uh, had any involvement with it because of small town law practice. You just don't get into that. You just get the deputy goes and serves the papers, no extra charge, and it works out great. But uh, real quick, final description of copy service. And then uh, I'm going to let Ron say any other comments he wants to. And then we're going to put this up in the litigation uh, discussion board just so you can kind of see that we've kind of shared a few things. Um, and so the, what I want to describe for you really on the board is the way that the copy service really works. And I've, I've talked a little bit about this before. But what has to happen first is the deputy goes to the house. So I'm going to put a house here and a door, okay. So the deputy, uh, he'll either like just, well, I've seen him just put the papers inside the screen door like that, okay. Or I've seen him actually tape the papers on the door, you know, with tape. So they just put tape on it, you know. And then I've also seen what they call knob service, and I wanna kinda show you this. Cause this is the way they used to do it in Ohio. <clears throat> And so here's a knob on the door, okay? This is kind of what a doorknob looks like, okay? So what he does, he comes up and he puts the papers in a tube like this, okay? So he wraps the papers in a tube, and then he puts a rubber band around it. In fact, if you're ever at my office over in Anderson, you'll see, well, there's two rubber bands on my doorknob. Well, why are those two rubber bands on the doorknob? Well, if you want to leave me anything, you can just leave it like that. That's one way of copy service. But Ron, what's the second step to copy server? The second step? Yeah. As far as you've got to acknowledge that it was there. Well, but you also you have to do the mailing. You have to mail, and typically you then follow up with um, an advisement from the person who served, you know, that they have done it in the form that they used, and uh, still no guarantee of personal receipt. Right. But here is the thing that I noticed was throwing some of you. Regular U.S. mail. So in other words, first class, you know, person's name, 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 and then it says clerk, clerk, clerk up on here. It's got to be mailed by regular U.S. mail to consist of copy service. Then as Ron says, you fill out an affidavit of service or at least some kind of certificate and a lot of times it's on the back of the summons you just flip it over and you fill out the form that says I serve such 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 a day by copy service just check copy service and it says right on there by leaving and by mailing by regular US mail and then you sign at the bottom and you hand that back into the clerk stamp sealed put in the folder with the rest of the papers in that case. So that's pretty much copy service. So I just want to share that because there's some confusion uh, about certified mail service being confused with copy service. Now, and that brings me to the final thing, which is certified mail, is uh, where you actually send them a letter by certified mail. But the problem is the guy gets a little orange card that says, you've got a certified mail letter. You need to come to the post office and sign for it. And then it says, sender, Grant County Clerk's Office. So you think you're gonna go and pick up that letter? No, they don't go. So certified mail costs you a bunch of money. When you're doing this on a mass scale, like you're doing all rental properties for a company and you're doing 100 at a time, you know, five, six dollars a piece, way too much money to be spending on certified mail when the return is just not that good. Now, the flip side of that is though, you know where the guy works from his application to move into that apartment? Send it certified mail to his employer. I used to do that all the time because then a neutral person signs for the certified mail. They do it every time. 
So that's, that's the way around it. If you're going to use certified mail, my suggestion is use an employer, some kind of a third party that will actually sign for the papers. I know when I had a guy that was in the military, for example, in a divorce, serve it on the company commander. And man, I mean, that thing gets straightened out in like no time. Company commander's not going to put up with a deadbeat in his outfit. Okay, so those are just some little things. Uh, one last one is publication. I'm not going to spend much time on that because uh, it's not very good. It's not very useful. It's very expensive. And, uh, basically, what it is is you put it into a paper of uh, normal circulation in that community. Uh, you know, it's got to be intended so that someone in the family will see it. Uh, and, you know, I just never had very good results, especially with the cost of it. Um, so, you know, that's basically uh, what I'm up with. There. But don't forget, sometimes statutorily, notice by publication is required. Yeah. Depending on the type of case and matter that you're dealing with. Yeah, so as a paralegal, you want to scope that out and really look at those uh, early rules and the rules of civil procedure in the four range, 4.4 uh, around in that range there where you can really hone in on that and find out because there are some cases that demand uh, that you do a couple different things and even require publication. So, uh, and you get into some estates and some things like that where that's an absolute requirement. And the purpose on that is to notify creditors, people like that, or family members that maybe have lost touch with the decedent you know, things like that. So uh, a lot of considerations there. We're going to put that up there and then uh, we're going to um, come back later and do another uh, discussion on uh, some of the later chapters in litigation. So hope you enjoy this. Uh, good luck over the next few days in trying to gain uh, access and understanding of the material in your text. And let me know if I can help you. Always available, robdaywalt at me.com. Thanks.